Mr. Happy Living here, and I'm happy to be broadcasting from WITV7 in the beautiful Queen City, Charlotte, North Carolina, USA. Hey friends, take a moment with me right now and just imagine how amazing you'd feel living the unique and distinct life you were put on this planet to live, doing work you love, in places you love, with people you love, and all the while creating something of real value to others. That's what I call a life of significance, and I can tell you it makes a very happy life. And so can my friend Harry Bain. He's my guest star today, and he's here to share his unique and distinct journey to his life of significance. Hey, Harry, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I appreciate it, Matt. Just take a minute, if you will, and tell us what you're doing these days to make your mark of significance on the world. Well, um, this is my 53rd year of practicing law, so that's uh, a significant achievement for me. I'm one of the only lawyers in Texas uh, that has been practicing more than 50 years, and I am getting ready to open uh, a rather uh, interesting uh, art and auto museum along with uh, my law office, which is in the museum, that'll be part of it. So I'm pretty busy right now. Pretty busy. And you just, you were practicing law today, as I, as I think I know. Absolutely. I had a hearing this morning with uh, a judge and another attorney, and that's why I've got this silly tie on. I normally, <laughs> <laughs> I normally would be here in shorts and a t-shirt, probably. Uh, very good. Okay, folks, today we're going to switch things up a bit. I met Harry about a year ago when I discovered he was building this museum. He's calling it the Bain Fine Art and Automotive Museum. It's in a town called Pittsburgh in Northeast Texas. And what I discovered when I went to meet him and then got to know him and then got a tour of this amazing museum that he's creating from scratch is he's a man of incredible experience and character and passion for living life well. So today, what I, what I wanna to try to do is let you get to know Harry through the many and varied life experiences that led to the creation of this most amazing museum. So Harry, why don't you get us started by telling us what you love about cars. I remember you sharing a memory with me um, about being a five-year-old or so and driving with your dad, standing on his lap, and naming models and years of cars that you saw during your drive. Can you, do I have that right? Well, you're partially right. I was three. And uh, for some reason, uh, when I was born, it was kind of like a person being born who could immediately play a piano. I was in love with uh, automobiles back in the, uh, in the uh, middle to uh, late 40s. And uh, my father uh, was uh, an Air Force officer and he would buy a new car every year and I would uh, be excited about that. But uh, the incident you're talking about was when I was three, I would stand up in the front seat of his uh, 1948 Roadmaster, Buick Roadmaster. And as we drove down the road, I would identify every car coming towards us and every car passing us. And my father would look at me and say, how did you know that? And I would say, oh, well, I don't know, but that's what it is. Hmm. And um, that that's how it started, actually. That, that's crazy. So how many cars or other vehicles, because you have other vehicles in there, will you ultimately have in the museum? Well, I have 63 vintage cars in the museum. And uh, of course, I have... Um, other types of vehicles, uh, motorcycles. Uh, I've got, um, let's see, uh, I have some boats in there right now, but uh, most of the time I have them on the lake where I live here. Mm -hmm. So they're in for the winter, but outside of that, it's cars and motorcycles mostly. Very good. And weren't you just hauling another one home yesterday? Yes, uh, I picked up from Dallas from the guy that does a lot of work with me. Uh, he's a mechanic and has a really fine shop. Uh, a 1970 uh, Torino, Grand Torino GT uh, 429 Cobra Jet. So it's a, it's a pretty sought after uh, muscle car. Awesome. So Harry, what's the fastest car you have? Well, I have four cars that'll go over 200. 
So I've got a Ford GT uh, 2005 model. I've got a um, 2007 uh, Carroll Shelby GT 500. I've got a, a ninth, uh, excuse me, a 2001 Dodge Viper ACR GTS, which is a racing Viper. And I've got a Corvette ZR1. Um, it's stock, but it's um, it's 630 horsepower. So it'll go over 200 as well. Goodness. So which is the most expensive car you have? Oh, really? I, you're talking about for value or what I paid for? It? <laughs> for value, for value. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I've got a 1931 Avon boat-tailed roadster, which was a predecessor to the uh, Austin Healey. And it's one of only three left in the world. So it's pretty valuable. Um, of course, my Ford GT has tripled in value since I bought it. So it's, it's a valuable automobile. Um, trying to think if there's, I've got one, 37 Ford Coupe, which is a nine-time national prize winning car. So I don't know what it's worth, but I've got a few valuable cars in the collection. Yeah, yeah. And folks, it's incredible. I, I want to try to convey as we have this discussion today, how much of the work Harry does by himself. So he's walking me through the garage and he says, you know, I'm working on this one. I'm working on that one. I'm thinking to myself, yeah, he's working on him. You mean like I describe when I'm working on something, you're having somebody do the work for you. No, he's doing the work himself. Uh, Harry, what's the most unusual vehicle in your collection? Wow, that's a that's a tough question. Uh, let's I remember see. a truck. I remember an interesting looking truck and uh, motorcycle. Oh yeah, I've got a machine gun on it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I've got a 1931 uh, Model uh, A. Uh, Texaco Wrecker, and it's fully restored just as it was in 1931. And um, if I don't make it as an attorney, I guess I can make it as a record driver because I have the equipment. <laughs> Very good. And speaking of Texaco, you have explained what you've replicated beyond the truck in your museum. Yes. Well, I have a separate building uh, right across from the museum where we restore cars and do maintenance work on the automobiles. And I built it like a, uh, a 1950s um, Texaco station. Texaco was a Texas company and it had a plan for all its stations. So I, I took that plan and I built this service station as a place to restore cars. And it's a little bigger than a normal Texaco station. They would only have like two bays, but I've got five bays in there and we do a lot of work in there. That's great. It's so, it's so amazing to see folks. It's like going back in time. Okay, before we leave cars, tell us a story about one of your favorites. How you acquired it or crazy acquisition or just one of your favorite stories about one of your favorite vehicles. I can tell you one of my most embarrassing and difficult moments with a car, if you'd Perfect. like. Yes. Uh, in, in 1986, uh, my wife and I were getting ready to have our first child. She was uh, nine months pregnant at that point and ready to pop. And I had gone to a, uh, a swap meet, the third largest one in the world in Texas. and, and while I was there, I spotted a 1967 GTO four-speed. And uh, it was a car that I had coveted for many years. And the fellow who had restored it from Oklahoma, he had done it just exactly like one that my roommate in law school had. And of course, when I was in law school, I used to double date in that car with my roommate. And I, I really coveted the car. I know it sounds bad, but I wanted that car really bad. And so when I saw this car, it was a duplicate. It was an absolute duplicate of the car in law school that I used to ride in. So I came home and I told my wife, uh, I found a car. I'm interested in buying it. And she said for the only time in her life, don't buy the car. And I thought, well, 
you know, okay, why? Well, we're getting ready to have a baby. I don't have a job. And you have just left your job with the federal government and have opened your law practice. And we just can't afford to do it. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, I'll take that advice under consideration and then I'll make a decision, <laughs> which was probably not really a good thing to do. But I went back and the next day the guy you know, wanted to sell it and I wanted to buy it. So I ended up buying it and I put it in my uh, museum in Dallas that I had at the time. And my wife never even knew it until about four months later. And when she found out, she, uh, she didn't say anything, but I came home from work every night for uh, three months with my dinner on the table and no discussion regarding it. So uh, it's kind of a sore subject. I see. I, I don't blame you. So uh, last thing on cars, what do you want visitors to experience when they're in your car museum? Well, I'll tell you what. Um, I think I've been fortunate enough to know the car business pretty well. And so I have bought uh, one of every car that I know other collectors would like to have uh, because I love them. And the reason that I do is probably because everybody else does too. So um, when they walk into the museum, they're going to see a collection of muscle cars, hot rods, uh, foreign exotic cars, uh, race cars, all of whom they're going to be interested in. And I love to watch the twinkle in their eye when they see the car and they see how pristine it is and they remember back to a time when they either wanted one of them or had one of them. Yeah, good stuff. <clears throat> All right, Harry, let's move on to talk a little bit about your military education and career. So okay. what, did you, what did you do in your military education and career? Well, as I told you, my dad was a military officer and he, uh, he rose to the rank of general. Uh, even though he started as a private in the army. So mm. he did very well for himself. He was a World War II pilot. Mm. So I always wanted to be an Air Force officer. And um, I went to the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina, which is the second oldest military college in the United States. And I graduated from the Citadel in 1967, uh, number one in my class. Mm. And that was right at the height of the Vietnam War. So they needed lawyers to try court martials for uh, people mm. who had committed crimes during Vietnam. And uh, instead of going to Vietnam, you know, directly, they sent me to law school. And I went to SMU and in Dallas, and I graduated in 1970. And at that time, I was a captain. And so I immediately went to Washington, D.C. and started trying court martials. And that's how my military career began. Very good. Can you give us uh, one of the great big highlights or two of them maybe from your service as you look back at, at your time in the service that, that you recall or that shaped your life or just one or two big highlights? Uh, well, I guess... Um, one of them was my first trial as a military lawyer. I had just passed the bar. I had just gone to Washington, D.C. I was stationed at bowling across the uh, river from the Pentagon. And a young man came in to see me, and uh, he had been accused of committing uh, a, a crime and needed a lawyer. And at that time, if you were reasonably available, he could choose you. So he chose me. And I told him, I said, you do not want me because I've never tried a case in my ever loving life and your life's on the line. You could end up in Leavenworth and I don't want to have that responsibility on my plate. He said, no, I want you as my lawyer. So I took the case. Um, it was a two day trial, very much like the courtroom in To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm -hmm. uh, the captain of the honor guard for the United States Air Force was his accuser. And he was accused of bringing dishonor upon how, the United States Air Force. How old were you? I was, uh, let's see, 25. Okay, so this is, a, this is big. This is big because, yeah. you know, the Air Force Honor Guard is one of the premier uh, 
organizations in the Air Force, and the captain of the Honor Guard was accusing him of bringing dishonor at a military funeral in mm. Arlington Cemetery. Mm. So I, I thought, okay, if you're going to choose me, I'm going to turn into F. Lee Bailey because I just, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Mm. So I prepared that case like it was a, uh, it was a huge murder trial. Mm. And I ended up winning it. And when I won it, the whole courtroom just broke into uh, clapping and cheering wow. and everything else. And my, my client, you know, he was so relieved and I was more relieved. <laughs> so that was a very big thing for me. My first military trial where a gentleman uh, put his whole faith and trust in me. That's awesome. It gave me goosebumps. So one last question on, on this part. Um, what did your military service teach you that you're still using today to get this museum created and completed? Well, I went into uh, the Citadel Military College as a boy, and I came out four years later as a man, and uh, it taught me a lot. It taught me honor. It taught me integrity. Uh, it taught me honesty, even though I was much like, you know, um, yeah, the, the guy in Happy Days. I mean, I was a really good kid. I was always, you know, my father was always very uh, conscious of me growing up the right way. And he taught me all the right things. So, and my mother as well, obviously, but I don't know. Uh, when I left the Citadel and I went into the Air Force itself, I, uh, I just swore I was going to do the best job I could do every day uh, for whatever it was and for whoever I was doing it for. That's great. Okay, Harry, let's take a quick break to let our sponsor <laughs> spread a little love with our audience. Okay. Mr. Happy Living here. I love good things made by good people. That's why I love my relaxed sauna. I bask in its healing far infrared rays every morning. In just 20 minutes, I sweat as much as if I'd run four miles but I'm not exhausted. Instead, I feel great. And I've boosted my metabolism, burned calories, sweated away toxins, and some body fat too. What a relaxing and healthy way to start a day. A study in Finland found people who regularly use saunas live longer and have fewer fatal heart problems. So get the benefits of a sauna in your home for your family too. It's surprisingly affordable, it's portable, and it fits nearly anywhere. Go to happyliving.com and select Partners in Happy to get 100 bucks off any purchase of $1,000 or more. And I'll donate another $100 for every order placed during the entire month of December to WYTV7. So here's my idea for you. Get a relaxed sauna for yourself this holiday season and give another as a gift. And we're back, and this is the Something Significant Show, and I'm your host, Matt Gersper. And my special guest star today is Harry Bain, and we're talking about the incredible experiences he's, that he's had in life and how he's using them to build an amazing museum to share and inspire and educate all who come to see it. So, Harry, I recall that you worked for, is it four different presidential administrations? Is that correct? That's correct. So which presidents did you serve? Well, in, uh, in early 1972, uh, I was sent over to the Economic Stabilization Organization, which was formed by President Richard Nixon to uh, counteract double digit inflation. Mm -hmm. And I was a chief counsel for one of those divisions. So I worked for Richard Nixon for about two years before he left office. And the others? Uh, then I transitioned over uh, and I, I got a job as the assistant regional counsel for the Federal Trade Commission under um, uh, Gerald Ford, President Gerald Ford. 
And I worked for the FTC as the assistant regional counsel in DC for uh, three years. Uh, that led to a job with the uh, original Federal Energy uh, Administration under uh, Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter. And then when Carter left office and Reagan was elected, I got, uh, it, it was changed to a cabinet level department, the Department of Energy, which is what we have today. Mm -hmm. And I was promoted to be the chief counsel under Ronald Reagan for the uh, Department of Energy in Creek Production. So I had about oh, 35 attorneys working for me and about 40 mm -hmm. auditors. And we did most of the major audits of the oil companies uh, back, back in the mid 80s. Very good. So of the four presidents you served, which was your favorite? Well, without doubt, Ronald Reagan was my favorite. Um, I thought when he was elected that he was kind of a lightweight since he was mm -hmm. uh, an actor. And what did he know about the government service? But what I soon found out is that he was a brilliant individual and he um, he was able to find the best people to work for him. And uh, he made sure that they did uh, the work and gave him the advice that he needed to be president. And frankly, you know, not since Abraham Lincoln have we ever had a president like Ronald Reagan. Hmm. Yeah, a lot of people underestimated him, didn't they? Yeah, they did. And they didn't even like him being elected. And and uh, <laughs> right. they soon found out that he was no bit, no nonsense. He was all business and he had the American people in his mind at all times. So what's your favorite collection in the museum from your days serving the highest office in the land? Well, I, I fortunately have a large uh, piece that's on my wall in my conference room that was given to me by Ronald Reagan uh, when I served under him. And I guess that's my favorite. Yeah. yeah. Uh, folks, I can't wait for you to experience what is in this museum. It's just, it's just spectacular. Uh, Harry, what's the most amazing experience that you had in your service to the president? Can you tell us, give us a story about just an amazing experience? Well, um, again, I would I would go to Ronald Reagan's administration. Um, I mean, I had I had a very good uh, government career, and at the time, uh, you know, we we didn't put up with a whole lot of nonsense in the government, even under Jimmy Carter's administration, uh, who was the only Democrat I worked for. Um, you know, we did our job. Uh, we didn't make excuses for not doing it. Uh, we fired people if we had to. We hired people when we needed them. Um, and there weren't, it wasn't the typical government employee that you tend to see today. There's a lot of great people in the government service, but there's a lot of uh, excess in the government service today. Mm -hmm. And even when I was there and left in 1986, there were still more people in the government service that needed to be there. Mm -hmm. So the American public was paying for more, but more bodies than they needed to yeah. perform the federal government function. And it's gotten a whole lot worse since then, unfortunately. Yeah. So kind of speaking of that, one of the questions I was thinking about is, what did you learn about in, in that time and, and that, those administrations about some people seeking power and others serving people? Well, uh, to be honest with you, uh, all four presidents that I served under uh, fell in the latter category. They, they were people who wanted to serve uh, the American public. Uh, you know, you can see uh, the things that were done by Richard Nixon were done by uh, Gerald Ford. Uh, we're done by Carter. I mean, look at his record since he left the office as president. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's a real humanitarian mm -hmm. and Ronald Reagan. And I, I didn't find any of these four people seeking glory over mm -hmm. a responsibility. Never. Not any of the four. Now, I've seen some since, but uh, 
Mm. But I didn't see any then. Very good. And finally, what do you want visitors to experience when they're in, in this part of the museum that's reflecting your life of serving the law and serving our country? Well, you're going to see uh, some very interesting things. Uh, we have a whole section on exploration of outer space, all mm. of the shots to the moon, all of the space, uh, uh, you know, uh, projects. Uh, Apollo 11, 12, 13, 17, you're going to see a lot of that, a lot of memorabilia from those, some of them flags that were flown on the moon. Uh, you're going to see a whole section on military uh, achievement that my father had. He was a World War II hump pilot um, and uh, served 30-some uh, years in the Air Force, retired as a general. Um, so a lot of his accomplishments will be in the museum. I fortunately, when I went to the Citadel, was uh, an aide to General Mark Clark, who was a World War II general, four star, who mm -hmm. invaded Italy and took out Mussolini. And uh, I got to know him very well as his wow. aide. So I have a lot of his memorabilia that will be in the museum as well. So I've been very fortunate in my military career to meet a lot of very, very nice people very accomplished people, and some of that will be uh, demonstrated in the museum itself. Yeah, awesome. I'm glad you brought up all the space interests and, and memorabilia, because I'd kind of forgotten that, and that's a really cool part of the museum. Uh, okay, so let's, let's move on to African art and adventures. So what drew you to be a collector of African art? Well, I'm a uh, Park West collector. Uh, Park West uh, Gallery in Detroit, Michigan is the largest private art dealer in the world. And um, so we're a VIP collector, my wife and I. We've been with them almost 20 years. And, um, you know, we've, uh, we've just fallen in love with art of every kind. Of course, we were art collectors before that, but we're even more dedicated now. And one of, the, um, one of the individuals that we met as a Park West artist uh, was a fellow by the name of Andrew Bone. Mm. Uh, I now consider Andrew my brother by another mother because we are very close. I just came off of a safari, my wife and I did with he and his wife. It's the third one we've taken to Africa. And uh, we have just been uh, submerged in the dark continent and all the great things that it has delivered to the world, um, all the great animals that exist there, all the great people that are there that have contributed to the world's uh, uh, better uh, shape. And uh, if you've never been to Africa, it's a place you have to put on your bucket list because mm -hmm. it is one of the more beautiful places in all of the world. Well, give our, give our audience a little vision into how Andrew does his art and what it, and, and just maybe describe a few pieces because it, it's really spectacular. Well, Andrew is, uh, is English by birth. Uh, his mother and father were both English. Uh, they raised him in Zimbabwe. That's where he was born. Zimbabwe used to be Rhodesia mm -hmm. and it's now Zimbabwe. He fought during the uh, Rhodesian War on the side of Rhodesia, and mm. they lost. And, of course, he had to leave there and go to South Africa. So he lives in Peter Marisburg in South Africa. He's a self-taught artist, but he's one of the world's best, um, I guess you'd call him wildlife artists. Mm. Uh, and I know a, a number of them, so he's right at the very top of that tier. And um, we are his largest collector. We have about 60 of his pieces of work. Um, and uh, all of those are in the museum, along with other African artists and African uh, artifacts. So we have sculpture. Uh, we, have, uh, we have actual taxidermy of some of the animals that I obviously wouldn't hunt, but I, I have procured from other collections in the world so that people who never go to Africa, like uh, older people or maybe even young people who have never been there, get a chance to get up close and personal with uh, one of these animals. And uh, they are truly extraordinary. 
Yeah, I recall it being in your in your car garage and you said, hey, come over here. And he Harry sneaks me over and, and behind this car is a is a full size lion. <laughs> it's kind of uh, it's kind of overwhelming. <laughs> That'll be in one of the rooms in the museum, actually, yeah. because I really want to see the look in a child's eye when they yeah. peek around the corner see that lion standing there. <laughs> yeah, it's something else. So I know you're you're just back from another safari experience. Just give us a minute or two on what was a highlight of, of this trip. Well, it was extraordinary. Um, you probably have heard of Kruger National Park. Kruger was uh, dedicated back in the 30s by the, the former president of South Africa, uh, Mr. Kruger. And it's the largest uh, animal park in the world. Mm. Uh, it's all natural. So there are no cages, no fences, no nothing. Uh, it is all natural. And uh, it's as big as three or four different states put together. Mm. So it's huge. Wow. It takes up maybe a third of South Africa. And we spent time in, in two areas of the park, in the midsection and in the southern section. And we saw the big five, uh, not only the big five mammals, but the big five antelopes uh, two or three times while we were there. And that's pretty rare. You don't, you don't always see the big five. When you're there. So what describe the big five. Well, the big five are considered to be the elephant, uh, the leopard, uh, the lion, the Cape buffalo, and what am I missing? Giraffe. Um, Giraffe. No, Giraffe. no, not the, no, no, the rhino, the rhino, the rhino. Okay. so the rhinoceros, yes, those are the big five, and um, so I saw all, all five of those in all different kinds of uh, areas of the park, and they're just magnificent animals, and then there's the big five antelope, and they include the kudu, the sable, um, let's see, the bush buck, uh, the gems buck, and one other one. What's the other one? Well, I can't think of it right now. Um, but there are five big antelopes in Africa, and then the, rem the remainder are smaller. But they're all magnificent animals. So they're mm -hmm. They're the kind of thing that if you get to see them live, you're a very lucky person because they're, they're just absolutely beautiful to see. Awesome. So I want you to try to describe for our audience the entry room of your art museum and how you acquired that massive table that's right there when you walk in and how you'll have the big five displayed in that room. Well, uh, in the entry, it's going to be dedicated to uh, Andrew's art. So there is uh, a large painting, the largest of his career, of an African bull elephant on, on the charge, right coming right out of the canvas at you. And that's at the end of the room as you come in. On each side, I've got uh, two of the big five. So, um, and they're large canvases. And they are just absolutely magnificent. And then in the center, I've got a, a tree actually, and the tree is laid on its side. It's about 14 feet long. And uh, it came from Southeast Asia. Uh, and it is a magnificent tree. I selected it because uh, the height of the tree resembles and even feels like the height of a real elephant. And mm. I would know that because I've walked with real elephants. I've touched them. I've had my hand in their mouth. I've felt the bottom of their paws. Uh, they are just amazing, amazing animals. So, and on top of that tree, I've got a female uh, lioness. So yeah. it's a it's it's when you walk in it's pretty surprising because pretty cool. it is um, yeah it's 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 something to see. It's very cool. So last thing on on African art, what's your single most cherished piece that you have in the museum? Of African art? Yeah. 
Well, I suppose it's Andrew's largest uh, piece, the, the elephant, although I also have his largest uh, bird painting and birds are very important in, in South Africa. There's, there's over 500 bird species in the continent of Africa, which is more than any other continent on the planet. And uh, the most important bird of all, which you probably wouldn't guess, is a vulture, hmm. because vultures are what keep the uh, continent of Africa clean. And he did a magnificent, huge vulture with about a 12-foot uh, wingspan that is uh, up high on a wall in one of the African rooms. And I've never seen anybody do a job like that uh, with that animal, but it is unbelievable. Oh, very cool. Okay, let's move along to the masters and all the rest of the art. So Harry, how many total individual pieces are in the museum? Uh, you talking whole, about artwork? No, no, the whole thing. Art, law, cars. Okay, if I take if I take fine art, legal art, and car art, there's probably about uh, fifteen to 1,700 uh, individual uh, paintings. Very cool. And is it true that you've hung nearly every piece yourself? I've hung every piece myself. <laughs> I know. My uh, wife says I need. <laughs> <laughs> so I want people to understand how would so how would you describe the variety of artwork you have on display? Because you, you've talked about African art, we've talked about cars, but you, there's a wide variety that I'm, I don't know and can't describe. How would you describe it? Well, the art spans a period of time from the 1500s all the way up to modern day. It, it covers every genre of art. I mean, we have beautiful modern art. We've got the great masters like Rembrandt and Albrecht Durer and Hogarth and, you know, the Italian masters. Uh, we've got uh, Renaissance art. We've got, uh, we've got surreal art. We've got art from the Far East. Uh, we have art from the Mediterranean. Uh, you know, we have every form and format of art that you've ever seen in any museum in the country. The difference is that our museum has all of these genres yeah. and most museums concentrate on one or two. And yeah. um, I've just never been able to do that. You know, they're like kids. I love every one of them the same. <laughs> <laughs> I know I, I felt bad when I was asking for your favorites. So I want you to tell the audience also how you moved all of this stuff from Dallas to Pittsburgh. Well, I had a smaller museum in Dallas. It was about 10,000 square feet. Our current museum is 40,000. So it's four times as large. And the trip from Dallas to Pittsburgh is about two hours by car. And I have a 16 foot trailer, uh, enclosed trailer. So I made 350 trips from Dallas to Pittsburgh, round trips, by the way. And I moved everything uh, that we had in our homes and also in uh, my commercial buildings to East Texas. Folks, I hope you're getting a, a picture that this guy has not only done a lot of stuff, but he he does everything himself. I, he told me 350 trips <laughs> by himself. Yeah, I wrote every one. <laughs> I wrote every one down. I've got a list of every trip and how long it took. I, lo I love it. So I want you to, to uh, tell us some of the work that you've done in the museum with your own hands that would surprise people. Because I remember I came down to see you once and I walked into your office and you were in the back and I kind of saw like like peering through the at the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain and there you were ironing something. So I've just been amazed at all of the different types of chores that you do. So just give us a, a four or five or six that, that would be an unusual for an experienced lawyer such as yourself to be doing himself. Well, of course I work on all the cars. Uh, I, I restore the cars. I don't do everything on every car, but I do the majority of the work on most of them. Um, I built a separate shop just recently for woodworking and metalworking, and I'm doing all the displays for the museum right now in that shop, along with all the uh, 
uh, furniture refinishing. I've been refinishing furniture since the early 70s and I've done several hundred pieces, but I'm doing all the, uh, all the uh, antique pieces that are going in the museum. And when I finish one, I start on another. And when I finish it, I start on another. Uh, so I'm doing all that. I'm restoring a, a vintage 200-year-old uh, piano right now, an upright grand that'll be in the entry to the law office. And um, I, I just work on everything that goes in. If there's any damage to a frame, I fix that. Um, I reframe. I do whatever needs to be done to get, get it in what I call perfect shape. Yeah. Harry, I just love seeing you light up when you talk about all the various aspects of thinking about and designing and building this unique and distinct, I'll call it a one of a kind, only Harry Bain could have built it museum. And I, I want you to finish, well, finish, I want you to finish this with how are you going to feel when you imagine the first, how do you feel when you imagine the first guest walking in on opening day? Well, I'll tell you, um, you know, I had a smaller museum, as I said, in Dallas, and uh, I designed that one and, and had it built. And then when we moved out here to East Texas and bought our home out here, I started looking for land for this museum, and I found it right down the road from me. So I can go from my house to uh, the museum in my golf cart. It makes it really easy. Um, but I actually designed I'm the museum. I drew it on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper that I'll have framed in the museum. I told my wife, I thought we needed to build a museum to share what we had accumulated with the, with the public. And she immediately looked at me and she said, are you out of your mind? And I said, <laughs> no, I hope not. Um, and uh, from that point forward, we bought the land, uh, laid the foundation, built the buildings, um, and it was all based on that original eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And how, how do you so, feel when, when you imagine that being done and the public seeing it? How does it make you feel? Well, I'll tell you, um, you know, if you were a person who collected gold coins and you put them in the bank and you went and looked at them every few months, I don't see the joy in that. The joy would be sharing that with someone else who has never seen them before, almost like a treasure. Um, so when I built the building, I built it with the idea in mind that it's not going to do us any good to own this if we can't share it with others. Yeah. So that's the whole point of building it and opening it is that people come in and they relive their childhood. Uh, maybe even their uh, midlife or whatever, but they see cars they always wanted to own or they did own. Uh, they see art that they'll never see unless they go to seven different continents. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's just, it's very satisfying to me that I can, I can see on their face how, how it affects them, basically. Yeah, and that's, Harry, that's what this show is all about. It's finding that magic of life that comes from ordinary people doing extraordinary things and giving their time and talents and treasures in the service of others. So thank you for sharing your story with us today. And I want to wrap things up with a, with a lightning round of, I love the power of words and the capacity for quotes to change and impact people's lives. So I want to read a few of my favorites and have you tell us what they mean to you. First thing that comes to your mind, because it's called a lightning round. Okay. Ready? Ready. This is from John Burroughs. He says, I go to nature to be soothed and healed and to have my senses put in order. Uh, absolutely correct in every respect. From Leonardo da Vinci. While I thought I was learning how to live, I have been learning how to die. Well, that's interesting. I'm not sure what that means, but, uh, you know, I'm getting down the road here. So my time is shorter on the planet than it was when I was a lot younger. What I'm realizing is every day is a day to enjoy 
and uh, and to thank God for because you don't know when your next day will be. So I try to get up every morning with the idea in mind I'm going to accomplish something important and I'm going to enjoy doing it because I'm having more fun than the people that are going to see it. Honestly, <laughs> I can I can attest to that. From Paul Hawken, relax, take your time, work, practice, and learn. Uh, absolutely. Uh, one thing I learned in, uh, in the early days of working on cars is if you're working on something and it isn't going together, put it down. Come back the next day and do it. Mm. And if you do that, it all of a sudden just comes together. Um, mm. It's when you're tired and when you're trying to finish something, if you don't learn to put it down and come back to it, uh, you're going to be a frustrated individual. I, I finally learned that because I'm very, you know, my my wife calls me OCD, but I I am very, uh, you know, interested in getting something finished. But I, I learned that lesson and it's a good one. Very good. Very good. From Helen Keller, I long to accomplish great and noble tasks, but it's my chief duty to accomplish to accomplish humble tasks as though they were great and noble. Yeah, that's that's an absolutely true statement. I mean, you don't reach for the task. The task reaches for you, basically. Very good. From Jack London, the proper function of man is to live, not to exist. I shall not waste my days in trying to prolong them. I shall use my time. Yeah, I think that's important. There's uh, there's another saying about, you know, I don't want to waste my life. I want to come in like I'm sliding at second base with the dust flying and uh, enjoying touching that bag. So that's basically the way I do my job. That's it. That's it. This is our show anchor from Goth. Whatever you can do or dream you can do, like building a museum, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Begin it now. Oh, you froze, Harry. Well, was I supposed to say something? <laughs> <laughs> Just what you thought. I thought you you were... No, so that's the last quote. Whatever you can do oh, or dream you can do, begin, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Begin it now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me tell you something. I, I, the farthest thing from my mind when I was a young man was uh, owning a museum, believe me. I thought I was going to be an Air Force officer for the rest of my life, which would have been a great career. Mm -hmm. But it turned out I I, uh, I retired in 93 from the Air Force and, um, uh, you know, continued my law practice. But um, I never thought that I would own a museum. It just never came into my mind. So if you want to reach for something, reach for it, because. That's the only way you're ever going to get the brass ring is to go ahead and try to reach for it and do your best. And it worked for me. And I can't wait to open it to the public, really. <laughs> no, you can't. I can't wait for it to be open. Uh, and now, folks, it's your chance to be a giver, too. If you can hear my voice and you are inspired by today's show with Harry Bain, please share some love with our fabulous broadcast team by giving what you can to WITV7. They're a 501c3 charity on a mission to educate, empower, and encourage. They do good works with your kindness. Harry, I love your passion for cars and art and Africa and the law, and I admire the Herculean effort you're making to create a very unique and super cool museum from scratch, literally from the ground up, seemingly with your bare hands as an inspirational gift for any and all who will take the time to come and experience it. And I'm super happy that you've shared your dynamic energy and spirit and love of life on our show today. Will you please take a minute or two and share any parting remarks you'd like to leave with our audience? Well, I really want to thank you, Matt. Uh, you know, getting to know you has been very, very interesting. Uh, and as you know, you and I are partnering on, on a project in the museum. And I'm looking really forward for you seeing that in its uh, final stages. Um, you know, it's going to be a revolution to people who come in and get a chance to look at the artwork that you are 
placing in the museum uh, with me helping you get that done. And, you know, I can't wait to get it open. Uh, there's nothing I'd like to do more than share it with people on a daily basis for however long I have left on the planet. Um, mm. You know, I wished I'd have done it when I was 20, but you know, if wishes were horses, I'd own a whole stable full. So uh, I'm doing it now. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Harry. And I also want to You're thank. I also want to thank WITV7 for hosting and promoting our show so we can keep interviewing inspiring guest stars like Harry and reaching folks just like you ready to create your own extraordinary lives. And most especially, thank you, viewers and listeners. The website for the Bain Fine Art and Automotive Museum, it's not quite ready. So the best way to reach Harry for questions about the museum or comments about this show or just to encourage him for the final months to the grand opening is to email him at jagbain at yahoo.com. So that's jag, J-A-G, his last name, Bain, B-A-Y-N-E, at yahoo.com. One more time, all one word, J-A-G, B-A-Y-N-E, at yahoo.com. And from me to you, dear friends, I love you, and I want you to be really, truly, deeply happy. So I want you to go to happyliving.com and take our happy quiz. Because when you measure your happy, you'll focus attention on it. And focusing attention on it inspires change and learning and improvement all to flow right into your life. And once you take the quiz, and it only takes a minute, I hope you'll give some thought about what you and I can do together to make to improve the happy of your world one person at a time. Till next time, I'm Matt Gersper. You are awesome. And this is the Something Significant Show. And we're out. All right.